Well, hello there, this is Shane from Shane's Reviews, and I hope you are having a great day today. We're gonna continue talking about Orson Scott Card's Shadow of the Hegemon. It's part of the series, the Shadow series, that fills in behind the Ender series, and it's all part of the Enderverse, as it were. Anyway, about the narrations, I was very pleased with this. So the original companies that made this happen did a wonderful job. They put together a lot of people that were very talented. And as far as listening, it's really smooth. <laughs> I give it a very enthusiastic, yeah, thank you. Now, whenever it comes to this, yes, this is the book where it starts to kind of break away a little bit because there's a time period in the Ender series where he's traveling from Earth to the first colony. And that's where this fits into it because whenever Ender gets there, he finds out, you know, of course his brother kind of changed history and put the world together and became a hegemon and all kinds of other things. But there was a lot of stuff that was just glossed over from that because from the perspective of the stories at this point, the story on the inner side didn't actually need all this information. It was just good enough to say this is kind of what happened in the meantime because we find out that, you know, Enders made a lot of money at that point because of the investments that were made, etc. And it was interesting to see his side. Well, the other side of that is what happened to Earth. And this is but we find out. So we start out with a story. Of course, it's going to be following Bean some more and Sister Carlotta. And so they've kind of gone on a mission because a shill is starting to become much more of a problem. And he's starting to manipulate the governments of Earth and trying to posture and moving from this place to this place to this place, just pretty much anywhere any country that will a give him asylum b think that he's the great person that he pretends that he is but for him it's only who can help me further what i want to accomplish is where i'm going to butter the bread so we see some scenes that were actually quite masterfully done if you consider the age of the person because i mean there are people that have been in politics their entire lives that can't maneuver that way. And if it wasn't a fictional story, I don't think it would be done. <laughs> but there's a bit of realism in there. Uh, Petra, of course, was kidnapped as well as most of the Enders Zish whenever the last book was going on its little path. And Petra's the one that Ashil is really focused in on and is using her plans for world dominance, as it were. We see all kinds of these instances of this is bad and she knows it's bad but she's in a bad situation and trying to not get killed because there's a one trick pony whenever it comes to a shill and that is simply that if you see him in a weak point like a broken leg or if he does something wrong and then you call him out on it or you even see it happen he gets you on his murder list and then he will at some point kill you so there's a big path of destruction that's behind him where he tries to kill or has killed multiple people throughout the story. That was the thing that I liked about the last book. I think it was the last. Yeah, it was the last. No, the first book. <laughs> Sorry. The long of it all is in that first one, Bean kind of puts it to a shill whenever he gets to battle school. And he's like, mm, no, we're not going to put up with your crap. You're not going to do that crap here. You're going to turn yourself in and it's not gonna be fake. We're gonna have it recorded. You're not gonna be able to pull the heartstrings of anybody. You're gonna dangle here until you die or you're gonna fess up. And he got him out of battle school, which sent him back to earth. But of course, after the end of the Formic War, then all these countries were really upset about, you know, who's gonna lead this, who's gonna do this, who's gonna be this person for us. And as Shill starts to take advantage of that situation. Anyway, so we fast forward back to where we are. And there's some very interesting things that are occurring. The first one is, of course, Peter is acting as Diogenes and Locke, which are two fictional characters that he and his sister came up with, uh, Valentine, whenever we were in the first, very first Ender book. The part of where Peter is acting as both Diogenes and Locke to put out the propaganda of this is bad, this is evil, there's particular positions that each one of those fictional characters have traditionally took. One of them being that they never say anything bad about Russia, and they're very level-headed. And the other one is more inflammatory, but it's one of those types of inflammatory things of 
there's a point behind it and this is usually always right. So it's just left public opinion to interpret what was kind of said and to try to foster the world into a oneness. Even though it's coming from a earlier books, a very despicable person and then his sister taking the part of the despicable person. I respect what was done with that because it gave Peter the one that was too ready to kill, not having too much empathy. The one that really just didn't care about anything but himself, almost like a, a nihilist would present or a sociopath in some regards. So it's almost like this tool that he was using to help shape the world and to shape popular opinion for the betterment of mankind has actually bettered him as well, which is good. But you can still see in even this book, which I think is like six or seven books in, you can still see those remnants of that personality from Peter in this. And, you know, now he's got to that point where he's going through puberty, kind of. I think he's at that age and he's very unsure of himself. He has a lot of emotional things that he wasn't having in the past. And... You know, his brother and sister have left. One of Peter's biggest problems he's always had is that he always felt like, speaking of shadows, that he was in the shadow of his younger, youngest sibling, Ender. He always felt like he wasn't good enough, that he never got his mom and dad's praise, that he just wasn't good enough to be accepted. And so, I mean, that's not necessarily an out. So, you know, it's good to see that he's not only internalized this, but the way that this book goes in this particular direction, where Sister Carlotta and Bean end up actually meeting Peter to try to get him to come out of hiding, to actually announce who he is, because there's a lot of talk that, you know, since the actual hegemon is, you know, retiring or moving out of office or getting on a ship so that he's going to be incommunicado during this entire war. What a, a punk move that was. At the time that they would need them the most and having the abilities to communicate via Ansible instantly, the dude decides to get on a ship that's going to go close to light speed so that he's not going to be reachable. I mean, come on, <laughs> that's a cheap escape and shame on that character anyhow. But anyway, they want him to come out of hiding, but there's a problem, it's his age. And the world is kind of changing a little bit and they're more accepting of these young geniuses that are incredible tacticians and have abilities far beyond what normal mortal people would have just because of their intelligence levels and the way that they were trained. So there's more acceptance, but there's a master plan that's put into place for him to do this. And we get to see almost a realistic telling of how that might actually play out. He's afraid that, you know, all these people are going to be, oh, well, you're just a kid and all of his clout would go away. And he's really worried about that because that's the most important thing to him. If you put yourself in his shoes, right? He's wanting, he, he needs that validation. And if that validation stops, he's not getting it from his home. He's not getting it from his peers because he's so intelligent, it's hard for him to have peers. On top of all that, he's unsure of the future. He's known in the back of his mind what he needs to do, but he just hasn't done it simply because of the timing of everything. He wanted to make sure that he could push and make things happen, but if he reveals himself, he's afraid that he won't be able to do that. We will find out more about that, of course, in the next book. Now, uh, there is one important question that I'm going to ask you wonderful people. After we get through the main two parts of this, the first series is done, the second series, we're in this video on the second one, so there's like four, four, two or three more to go. Are you interested in the rest of them? Because there are prequels and then there's prequels to the prequel. And I'm going to be upfront and honest about it. If you guys and gals ask me to give the reviews on them, I will be happy to do that because that's the way this works. <laughs> However, I wasn't really a big fan of them. And it's not that it wasn't that Orson Scott Card didn't write them. He helped with them. He gave guidance on some of it. Oh my goodness me. I just, I was not a big fan of those. But maybe now that time has gone by and if I read them again, I might get something different from them this time around. So that's why I'm offering it. What kind of feelings was brought out from this book? And let's, let's kind of give it a bit of a, a rating on that. So as far as the emotional content of it, what did I get out of it? Mm, there was a little bit of anxiety in parts of it. And the reason why was uh, because of the emotional distress that some of the characters would be going through. Me putting myself into the shoes of these characters and, and doing my best to emulate what they would be feeling. So with that, yeah, there was a lot of anxiety, especially in that dynamic in between Ashil and Petra and the timing of things and some of the stuff that happened with Bean. Uh, that really, I kind of feel for the kid in a 
big, big way. Now, as far as the other story with Peter that was in there, it was more of a, could you put your, your big pants on and, and start to act like an adult? Uh, it's not, I don't want to sound like a smart aleck here, but I really wanted him to step up on his own without being coerced so much. And there was a very rewarding part in there in between him and his parent. And for that, Orson, which nobody calls you that, I know this, but Scott Card, congratulations, because that was a very pivotal moment for Peter and for character development as well and it was a big step in him being able to do what he's going to have to do next so we'll see what he does with it in the next review which should be shadow shadow puppets I think now you know what to do like share subscribe I appreciate you if you have watched all the way to the end I know it scraps does too we both appreciate you. I'm not sure which video you would choose over here because it should have sucked in by now. And if it did suck in, then there's two videos over here and or a very nice screen to look at with nothing on it. I don't know. Just depends on the day. Hmm. But anyway, <laughs> if you pick one of these two videos that may or may not be there, then I will certainly see you in the next video. Stay safe. Be healthy. Love you all. Thank you. Peace.